Hey folks, it's your pal Mike Shea from SlyFlourish.com and Twitter.com slash SlyFlourish here with the latest episode of Sly Flourish's Lazy DM Prep. This episode is brought to you by the Sly Flourish Empire on Patreon and the backers of Sly Flourish, the, the patrons of Sly Flourish uh, on, on Patreon.com. This includes uh, Jesper Cox, Scott McIsaac, Xavier Rodriguez, Chris Anderson, Mike Amir, Mason Petros, Jeff Coons, S Steve Johnston, Lexi Oberwetter, and Scott Turnbull, and many others. Uh, if you like the material you find on this show and the uh, uh, articles and tweets that you find on Twitter and the articles you find on slyflourish.com and you want to give back, you can do so by going to uh, patreon.com slash slyflourish. Uh, there is a link in the show notes below, both on uh, YouTube and on Twitter. Uh, it looks like my book uh, is overlapping. Oh, look at that. There we go with my camera. Uh, you can go over to patreon.com, you can click on the link below, and you can support Sly Flourish directly if you want. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, if you if you prefer to get all of this for free, you can. I plan to give it away for free continually. But if you want to give back, that is a way to give back. Uh, so, on this show, I go through the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, which you can see over there. Oh, God, I'm terrible at this. Uh... You can see the steps from Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. If you are not familiar with the eight steps of game preparation outlined in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, uh, there are a couple of ways you can learn more about it. There's probably about, I don't know, there's a bunch of ways you can learn about it. But uh, one of them is you can download the free PDF of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, which includes the, the first two chapters. Uh... <coughs> I swear I'm over my cold, but the allergies don't ever seem to stop. Luckily, I'm well hydrated. You can go in the uh, preview below and find uh, the one of the chapters of the two free chapters is the Eight Steps for Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. You can also take a look at a YouTube video. There's a video overview and a series that goes over each of the eight steps in detail. That way, on this show, we don't have to go through all the eight steps uh, for those who are um, familiar with all of these steps. Uh, let me pop out my little chat window here. If you are in the chat channel, please say hello, and uh, we can talk about just about anything related to D&D that you want. Uh, let's see, Big John Wallace is here. Hello, welcome. Uh, Kaltha is here. Gondolar is here. Excellent. Always nice to have folks to chat with on a Sunday morning. Hopefully you guys have a fine, tasty beverage. I am drinking a French vanilla um, pressed coffee. Oh, my God. Sometimes I bring my, my head through my hair and then it all sticks up because I need a haircut. Whatever. Um, so what else is there to say? Yeah, so the Patreon, the Patreon is new. Uh, so if you want to take a look at it. Oh, it also has a French press coffee, but it's black. I can't drink black coffee. I need weak milky coffee. It's the only kind of coffee I can take. Um, yeah, the Patreon is new. Uh, it is, again, here to support the works of Sly Flourish, uh, particularly the non-book works of Sly Flourish. The book works pay for themselves. But if you want to help support the website, or you want to help support buying equipment, or you want to support bandwidth costs, or you want to, you know, I have an Amazon server that I, that I run that costs me money where I, I do a lot of, you know, kind of research into the D&D world. If you want to help finance that stuff, you can do so by backing on Patreon. Uh, backers of Patreon get things such as previews of new material that I'll be probably putting up on Kickstarter soon. Um, there's actually a playtest for something uh, that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Uh, and the pictures of artwork and things like that. Uh, there is also a monthly newsletter. Uh, the newsletter is all of the things that the people who backed it on Patreon helped support, all of the, the material coming out of Sly Flourish that they helped support, uh, as well as uh, kind of things that caught my attention over the month. So it's just a, you know, a monthly newsletter of, um, a monthly newsletter of things that uh, caught my attention in the world of D&D. &D. So, uh, and I post that once a month. I post, I, I post a new post once a month because, for, frankly, even though people are backing the site, they probably don't want to receive a whole bunch of email. We talked about this in the chat channel before. Hey, my mom is here. Everybody say hello to my mom. She's in the chat channel. Uh, so, 
on to talking about Dragon Heist. Uh, I did not have a game last Sunday, and I, and therefore I did not have a show last Sunday. I couldn't have had a show anyway, because I was at 1D4Con. Uh, this is a local convention in West Virginia. It's about an hour and a half away. My wife and I have gone now for the past, I think, three or four years. I think this might be our fourth year. Really nice local convention. Uh, really fun. And... Um, uh, yeah, really good time. So I played five D&D adventures in three days, Friday, one on Friday, three on Saturday, and one on Sunday, and it was really good. Um, they were, yeah, fun adventures, and I learned a lot. One thing that I do, and I'm, you know, I, I, I will write notes to myself about what makes a good game on the other side of the table. Like, what do I notice about, like, what a DM does really well? One thing that DMs do really well that I don't is stand during a game. I really need to get better at this. I wrote a article about it. And um, probably the best game that we had um, was run by a guy named Michael Zhang, who is a local DM and wrote his own, he wrote a CCC adventure that we played. And super dynamic DM, really big, fantastic adventure. You know, we were sailing on a ship in the, in the elemental plane of fire. Uh, as Azir, you know, fire dwarves were manning the ship, we got attacked by a firecrack, and then we had to deal with politics of a Freedy, and it was just wicked fun adventure. He had really cool handouts, like artwork that he, you know, printed out and brought with him, and uh, and he's just a super dynamic DM. Stood the whole time, you know, really just threw himself into it, and and boy, boy does that make a difference, you know. I think there's I've seen a lot of DMs. Some are very there's kind of like active DMs and passive DMs and passive DMs are sort of going through the motions, but they're sort of sitting back and they're sort of rolling their dice. I've had some where they just like literally roll dice and point and say like four damage. And you're like, seriously, roll dice to say four damage. And then I've had other ones that are super dynamic. Jay Africa was also one of the best DMs I ever, I ever had the opportunity to play with. Um, Jay Africa was head of the West, West Coast AL group. Um, and now isn't because they don't really do those kinds of things they don't really have heads anymore but I'm, i think he's still involved in al and um just he was the first guy i saw who stood the like he just took the chair and moved it away there wasn't even a chair at the table and he, he played standing the whole time four hour game played standing the whole time and uh boy was he just an awesome dm like i didn't even know who he was right and i found out later that he's he's a big deal and i mean i could tell he was a big deal because he's a fantastic dm it's really interesting when you see like people who are big deals afterwards and you realize like yeah there's a reason like they're as well known and as popular as they are that's <laughs> because they really know what they're doing um so and of course uh, another one who falls in that category is uh our good friend james intercasso uh james intercasso is one of the authors of waterdeep dragon heist he's also one of the authors for waterdeep uh dungeon of the mad mage and he has a credit in the upcoming um uh ghosts of salt marsh and a uh, fantastic guy good friend of mine uh, I've been to many conventions with him, but I think, I, I'm sure I've played with him before, but I played at um, one at uh, uh, Winter Fantasy this year. I got to sit in, I got to play in a game of the Tarask, uh, what is it, uh, Planet of the Tarasks that he made, and holy cow, is he a good DM too, and again, another standing DM, and just really into it, and every, you know, even though it's a 20th level game, we had five 20th level characters it was just crazy but it was so much fun and he clearly loved his adventure so much and he was really into it and it was just he was a big like go forward dm work with the players kind of dm um yeah so you know being able to stand for that long is not something everybody can do um and and you know i recognize that too it's not a it's not a you know it's not a critical requirement but if somebody does have the some somebody does have the ability it's worth doing and it's something i want to do more of i don't know if i could stand solid playing D for four hours either but um uh, he's Nacho's prob Nacho problem. He's Nacho problem. It says newbie DM's preview of sa the sailing rules and Ghost of Salt Marsh looked awesome. I haven't seen them. I have I've, I've heard about them, uh, but I, I I don't think I saw newbie DM's sailing rule preview. Uh, so I'll have to check that out. Yeah, that's that's coming out. I guess a week from Monday. I think that's right. It's coming out within, yeah, it's pretty soon. Uh, Ghost of Salt Marsh will be out. And um, I'm getting it in like four different versions. I'm getting a whole bunch of them. I think I'm getting the collector's edition from my local game shop, and I'm getting the D&D Beyond one. And then I'm going to be getting the Beetle and Grimm box set. So I'm getting lots of versions of Ghost of Salt Marsh, and I can't wait to kind of dig into that. Um, that'd be, it's going to be a fun adventure. Looks like a really fun adventure. It's nice to play a big sailor adventure. 
So, but today we're not talking about Ghost of Saltmarsh. We can talk about Ghost of Saltmarsh, don't get me wrong. I'm happy to talk about anything. But um, why don't we take a look at the Waterdeep Dragon Heist game? So last, as I mentioned, and then went on a tangent for whatever, 12 minutes. Um, May 21st, yeah. Uh, it's the 17th. Is that's like Tuesday, I think? Is that right? I think that's Monday or Tuesday. A week from Monday or Tuesday. Um, 17th is Friday. My birthday. Hey. And uh, so 18th is Saturday. Sunday would be the 19th, Sunday, and uh, Monday is the 20th. Yeah, so it's the Tuesday, week from Tuesday. Uh, so I'm running Waterdeep Dragon Heist. And uh, as we've talked about in the show previously, I just ran through chapter two, which was the uh, Troll Skull Alley chapter. And that one is a big open chapter with lots of stuff going on. Uh, it's a tricky chapter to run. I've talked about it in many episodes here, I think about two or three at least two or three episodes. Hey, look at that. Not my, not the main character. Also has a birthday on the 17th. That's awesome. Uh, I have another D&D friend who also has a birthday on the 17th. We always say happy birthday to one another. It's very funny. Uh, but that's, yeah, that's cool. That's also that weird statistical thing that if you get like 12 people together, the likelihood that two of them have the same birthday is pretty high. The likelihood that you have a birthday with me is not very likely, but the likelihood of two people having the same birthday is pretty high. Shockingly high. Um, so uh, didn't have a game last week, but we got through chapter two and we began the last session, which was two weeks back. Uh, we began with uh, uh, Fireball, which is chapter three. And unlike chapter two, Fireball is a big, direct, uh, a big, you know, clear, direct chapter where a fireball explodes in the middle of Troll Skull. And this is what happened in my game. So this isn't necessarily what is happening in the adventure. This is what happened in, 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 in the version of the adventure that played at my table. Um, and so my villain for just so we're all clear about how this works like Waterdeep Dragon Heist if you're not familiar has four different villains you can select from and uh, I had previously played with Manshun as the villain and now I'm playing with uh, the Castle Anters as the main villain however you can sort of let the other villains sort of work their way in and so there's Xan Xanathar guys are involved and um, the Zinterim are involved Xan yeah, Xanathar guys are a heavy enemy Zinterim are involved but probably not Manshun I think I'm just removing Manshun from it uh, and Brigand Darth is is um involved in my adventure as well but they're more they're xanathar is sort of like the crazies that'll just keep attacking you even though they don't really know what they're doing and the uh brigand Arth are more like allies kinda so we'll see we'll see how that plays out um so uh the chapter starts when a fireball explodes in the alley there's a big picture of the fireball um, I think I talked at length last time about how cool it is to get like a normal spell like a fireball and show how a whole city would have to react to something like this. Um, when the fireball exploded, uh, they found two, they, so the bunch of civilians got hurt. They found the dead gnome who was carrying the Stone of Galore. They learned about the Stone of Galore. The Stone of Galore is the artifact that can apparently open up the, the vault that contains the 500,000 dragons. And uh, so they found the dead gnome. They... Um, found members of the Zinterim then got into a fight with members of the uh, Xanathar's guild. And then they got involved in that and the Zinterim guys got away. And they knew that there was one Zinterim guy in particular, a guy named Erstel Floxen, uh, who was a former, they found out later from, um, uh, from Sir Anton Greycastle's uh, special lady friend, uh, who is a Zinterim, she's a big Zinterim enforcer. And they found out from her that that Erstel Floxen hasn't worked for the Zinterim in some time. He's an assa a powerful assassin that is well known among the Zinterim, but had recently left the Zinterim. And the reason he left is that now he is a mercenary working for um, House the Castle Anters, but also for for House Grauhund. And he is the current possessor of the Stone of Galore. So uh, the characters um, they learned throughout the uh, session that uh, the um, uh, House Growlhund uh, was involved, that, that they, they found out through a couple different channels that the person who dropped the fireball on the party was a construct commissioned by House Growlhund. Uh, a, what do they call it? They have a name for it. Uh, a nimble right. <clears throat> they found a, a nimble right is sort of like an animated you know, animated dude. And um, so a nimble right that was constructed by House Growlhund um, 
is the one that dropped the fireball and it dropped the fireball because it saw the gnome it saw too many people going after the gnome at once and was worried that the the stone would get caught by somebody else um so what actually happened and this is probably let's drop over and we'll go over to our secrets and clues here uh let's see i don't need that anymore uh so we'll, we'll drop into our secrets and clues. We're going to jump around a little bit today, but don't worry. We'll go through uh, the steps. Uh, so one of the secrets and clues is that house sent uh, two different agents to get this stone. They sent... So the fireball was actually not an accident exactly, but it was a screw up. So if Erstel, um Bunch of secrets. Sometimes this is how it works. Uh, sometimes you just secrets just come pouring out of your, you know, pouring out of your ass, and you put them on paper while you're thinking about them. But the main deal is that Earth, the the Floxons, oh sorry, the Growlhuns sent two agents independent of one another to go get the stone. They sent Erstel Floxon, but they didn't really trust Erstel Floxon too much, and probably with good reason because he's an he's an assassin working for. He works for the Castle Lanterns, but he was on loan to the Growlhuns in order to go recover the stone. And the Growlhuns thought that once they saw Xan once the Nimble Right saw the Xanathar guys going after the gnome, it fireballed the whole area and nearly blew up uh Erstel Floxen, who probably got burned by it. And he's like, you know, you dumbasses, like I was just gonna kill whoever got it, and then we would have been fine. But no, you had to fireball a whole alley. You know, now everybody's paying attention to it. Now the city watch is involved. You just escalated this whole thing, and it's bad for the for the it's bad for everyone. So, yeah, this is kind of neat that like your villains can screw up, right? Like villains can make mistakes. Uh so he's not he's not your problem. Asks, did they find the necklace of fireballs? Iron yeah, they did. I had a really fun moment where like a a kid found it. Like the nimble right had thrown the necklace aside and ran. And they were chasing the nimble right, but they found the necklace. And like, I, forget, I think the rogue did. The rogue said, I go for the necklace. And he rolled and he rolled low. So it was like a, a kid grabbed it, like a street kid has it. And the street kid is looking at the rogue and the rogue's looking at it. And the street kid just goes to put like one of the, you know, the, the little candy colored balls in his mouth, like it's a gumball. And, you know, then we cut away and then we cut back and they're like struggling for the necklace of fireballs. And they got the necklace of fireballs and they gave it to the city watch. Um... You know, saying this is what this is where it happened, right? The city watch showed up after the explosion. They gave it to the city watch and said, "You guys investigate this." And then they went off to go investigate other stuff. And at the end, a black lacquer box from uh, JB Nevercott showed up, and inside the box was the same necklace of fireballs. He was like, "You know, you probably want to hang on to this." And so it's like, "Wow, how did it end up?" <laughs> and went right through the watch and into JB Nevercott's hands. Like, we are obviously not the only people he has in his employ. So that was a fun, you know. That was a fun little thing. Uh, another fun thing is that, um, and if any, you know, I hope none of my players are listening to this show. You should not listen to this show. If you are playing in my game, Joe Kupski, I'm thinking about you. Uh, you should not listen to this part of it. But one of the characters in our group um, is actually an undercover agent for uh, the Blackstaff. And he met with the Blackstaff, and the Blackstaff told him, here's the deal. Uh, we know that the Growlhun, we know that the warehouse where that where they tried to kidnap Neverember was um, 
was owned by the Growlhuns, and we found out that it was actually the Growlhuns lost all their money, but they were then funded by the Castle Lanterns. The Castle Lanterns have funded the Growlhuns. They're behind all of this. So they now know that the Castle Lanterns, you know, but only one of the players knows that, and whether he tells everybody else. Castle Lanterns are paying the Growlhuns, and in return, the Growlhuns are acting as a front for the Castle Lanterns. That's sort of the big, um, that's one of the big ones. Uh, Uh, does the party know that the gnome worked for the Never Ember family? Rainier would know the gnome. Yes. So this is a little bit of a hole in the story, but it's it's not it wasn't unmanageable. And the idea there is that uh, uh, Rainier Never Ember gave the stone to his gnome agent and said, "I've got people all over me. I've got Zents on me. I've got an assassin after me. I've got Xanathar Guild. I, I need you to take the stone and get it to the only people I can trust who are the group that that." You know, I don't know where it would go otherwise. There's too many people. And so he gave it to the gnome who was going to give it to the group. But then the stone got stolen. And then ne never Rainer showed up at the place. He's like, oh, man, boy, did I make a mistake. Like, I sure I was going to die. I didn't think anybody knew the gnome. But apparently they followed him. And the stone is gone. And let me tell you what that stone does. I don't know where the vault is. But I know that the stone opens up a vault. And my father embezzled a half a million gold dragons. And it's in a vault somewhere here in Waterdeep. And that stone is the key to get in. So now the, the party now knows, ah, three chapters in, and we now know the story of the adventure. <laughs> and somebody, I think one of the players is like, is this another side quest? And then I like held up the cover of the book. And he's like, no, I guess that's not a side quest. I'm like, no, this is, this is what it's about. This is your story. So, the, so they know, yeah, they know them, that the gnome worked for Never Ember. Raynar now met with them and is now at Trollskull Manor. And, and his goal is to find... Um, you know, there's really two things. They need to get the stone, and then they need to find the location of the vault. Um, and then, you know, other craziness could ensue. Like, what happens if the Castle Lanterns get there first? Um, you know, that's a struggle with the story. There's this key information that gets introduced several, several sessions in. Yeah, and, you know, and it's manageable. Like, chapter one, I think the only real hole is chapter two. Chapter two is a tricky chapter to run. And, um, I, I yeah, so I talked all about chapter two being kind of off the rails, uh, a little bit too far off the rails. And uh, I have, I think the Sly Flourish article getting ready for publication on Monday, uh, tomorrow is going to be about um, chapter two and uh, and then sort of off, you know, offer options on what chapter two does and what you should do with it and how it works and what you can throw into it. But anybody that's watched this show um, probably figured out it's, it's the same stuff. It's like, you know, chapter two, well, yeah, I'm not going to get into a whole chapter two, but there, you won't be surprised to see the stuff that I've got. Uh, so I've got a few secrets working already. Looks like I got, I don't know, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight secrets. I need two more. So sometimes the secrets just pour out of you and everything's cool, but we'll hang on to those last two secrets while we're, while we're chatting here. Uh, so, but we start with who the characters are. So the characters in my session, in my, in this game are Lord Anton Greycastle, human battle master, fighter, water, Davian noble, uh, and Yagra is his special lady friend. Um, he's a family, family is a rival of Zardoz Zord, who's the head of the ship. Uh, we have Greek Banjo Wilkerson. Uh, he is a tiefling bard, came from the Outer Ward. He's a childhood friend of Lord Anton Greycastle, but the uh, clash of cultures certainly gets between them. Uh, he was trying to build some kind of crazy stringed instrument. He ended up getting a magical one from Blue Alley. So now he's got a magical stringed instrument that does a lot. Um, he was kidnapped by Froon, got, but got away and worked for Dorn Dornan at the, at the portal. Uh, I should mention the fact that he... So he has a magical bardic instrument. I believe Anton Greycastle has a magic sword. 
Um, John the Grizzled is a uh, dwarf arcane cleric, uh, deals in lore. He's dirty and not really sociable, but he knows that something in the Nine Hells is coming to Waterdeep, and he is a brewer and friend of um, Hammond Craddock. Uh, I don't think he's got a real powerful magic item. Maybe prayer beads? I don't know. Uh, Aranis is a uh, drow packed to the fiend warlock. He knows that his patron has come to Waterdeep. Uh, his patron is Izakul, a devil who collects protégés for her master as Modius. Um, I think Izakul is a guy. Uh, I think I... Um, but I think that there's probably more. There, there's, there's, there's devil... There's crazy devil politics going on as well. I'm not sure that it's just as Modius... Uh, who could be involved in this. Uh, and then we have uh, Agarin, uh, who is a rogue investigator, former member of the City Watch, too old for this shit, kicked out of the City Watch, stole a draconic chamber pot, and is secretly working with the Grey Hands. Um, so he's working for... Um, secretly working for Blackstaff. Um, so... Uh, uh, I want to give everybody like one cool magic item in this in this uh, adventure. Um, he loves his, he loves him some magic. Oh yeah, so Erstel Floxen's crossbow. He has an acidic bolt firing crossbow. Um, so uh, those are the five main characters. We had a six character, but the player dropped out, and we have not brought a new new player in yet. Um, so, uh, I'm just sticking with these five for now. It's working all right. Typically, I like six players, because usually somebody's out. Um, not the main character says, I feel like they shouldn't have called it a heist. When my group got to the end, we were like, where, where was the heist? Yeah, it is, there's no heist in here. There, you can, you can actually put heist in here. I, I, you know, when I first saw the playtest, I was like, man, they should just call this the Dragons of Waterdeep, because Dragons of Waterdeep sounds so cool. And it sounds like there's dragons flying everywhere, but the reality is there aren't dragons in Waterdeep, because you can't have dragons in Waterdeep, except that it turns out dragons are gold coins. Like, I don't know. I thought that was really cool. And then you don't have to worry about Dragon Heist, but they called it Dragon Heist. So, hey, whatever. Here we are. Can't change it. But we can mark the fact that, you know, there's not really a heist. I think I have it in my Session Zero. Uh, I wrote an article about uh, Session Zero of Waterdeep Dragon Heist, and that's a big part of it, is that this is not a heist adventure, it's an investigation. However, there are at least a couple of scenes that can be heists. So one of them is this breaking into the Growlhund Villa. Um... Uh, breaking into the Growlhund Villa is a... Uh, a heist of sorts, um, and figuring out what's going on in there uh, is can can be pretty neat. Um, that's the way I ran it before. And then the other one is that they could end up having to break into the castle lanterns and steal something, and that could be really dangerous because the castle lanterns are pretty powerful. So um, there's two opportunities to drop in a heist if you want to drop in a heist. I think that um, there's also a bunch of DM guild material, uh, and there is, I think Joe... Um, Joey Hake wrote a uh, article on, I think he wrote, I think a couple of them wrote uh, ways to kind of manipulate this adventure. There's a, there's a DM Guild thing. Uh, I haven't really looked at it because I knew how I wanted to run it already, where you can, you can take uh, other angles on this adventure that I think make it more heisty. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a way to deal with it too. Uh, so, the strong start. Uh, this is tough. Like, I keep just hurling Xanathar people at them. And that's kind of lame. I mean, a devil might be, you know, something with bringing hell in here. Like, you know, are there... Help me, Twitch people. Is there a type of devil that makes sense as sort of a stalker and information broker that would wander around a city? Um... Uh, the Alexandrian also has an entire article series about restructuring. Yeah, I don't think I've seen that either. You can drop that in the notes if you want. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways to run it. And there's a couple of areas that I think um, that the adventure could use a little help. Uh, an imp could fly around and spy on them. Yeah, and they have another imp. I'm trying to think of something a little... Yeah, uh, yeah something from Toma Beast or Creature Codex would be pretty cool. Um... 
Let me take a look. Uh, I have to pull it up here. Cloud Drive. Documents. D&D. &D, fifth edition material. Uh, Cobalt Press. Let's start with... Let's see. Bring up the window. Oh, we'll drop it in here. Uh, Creature Codex 5E. Bink. Bink. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, Cobalt Press. I don't know. Look at this thing. This is weird. The cover, the cover art is way bigger than the. Um. Hey, look, Joey Hake and James Intercastle wrote for this too. Those dudes, man, are everywhere. And uh, Dan Dillon, uh, who now works for um, Dan Dillon, now works for Wizards of the Coast. And Joe, John Sawaski is one of the lead, I think he might be the lead writer for um, Salt Marsh. So these guys get around. Uh, all right, let's look at devils. Devil, 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 devil. Demons, devils, arch devils. Uh, yeah, it's not clickable, but I think that might be my browser. I think it actually, actually is. Um, uh, and not a lot of devils, but let's go to page 99. Winds harp. That does not look like something that's going to show up in the middle of the uh infernal night and look at that guy oh my god cr16 that is badass but that's not dropping into the game anytime too look at that dude though two melee attacks or uses a hellfire ball twice that's brutal uh fire amp might be kind of neat it's a little bit more powerful um then it's got the archduke devils belfigur devil shark so no real devils of note in the codex uh, what about in Tome of Beasts? Yeah, so, you know, one thing I, I know, like, I'm, I can be a jerk sometimes, and I'm going to be a jerk right now, devils. Um, I've heard when I post things out saying, like, what are the materials that people want that they don't have? Uh, people still say, like, oh, I'd love more monster books. It's like... Holy cow, like we've got five huge monster books between Creature Codex and Tome of Beasts. And as you saw, like the majority, you know, the number of people that wrote these books, including Wolfgang Bauer, right, are high. So these are, they're play tested. They're, oh, look at this guy, Devil Chort. See our, it's a little high. Crystalline Gilded Devil. Gilded Devil would be interesting because they, they care about the money. Uh, works for Mammon. This would be kind of neat. Maybe one of these guys. I think I might drop that guy in. Uh, ink Devil. Maybe he brings an Ink Devil with him. I think Ink Devils are just there to... Ooh, Ink Devils are not... There are no pushovers either. Harvester Devil. Lunar Devil. I ran the Lunar Devils before. They're awesome. It's like Horse Devils, Salt Devils, and Dinosaurs. But I think this Gilded Devil might be might be right. Because um, it makes sense that there's like issues with gold and stuff like that. And maybe he comes as like an agent. Um... So what does he want? Oh, whoops. I'm on the wrong thing. There's our gilded devil. Nobody in chat's like, hey, we can't see you doing any of their stuff. But I guess that's for the best. Um, a CR4 version of the gilded devil. No, I'll keep him at the same challenge level. You know, like he's really powerful. And I bet you the characters can beat a, C a single CR8 or CR7. You know, he'll probably beat their asses. You know, but they'll still manage to get it. The Black uh, Abishai. Um, yeah. Uh, Black Abishai would be an interesting one, too. That adds, like, the dragon the dragon thing. 
Um, the question is, like, do we need another faction? I mean, I guess it's not really a different faction because this guy would work for um, the patron. Um, but let's, you know, so let's let's ponder that a minute. Let's go back here. Uh, so what if we had a devil comes to Troll Skull, right? What does the devil want? So the, does the devil work for um, Aranus's patron, Isakul? Is he an agent of Isakul? Uh, that sounds right. And he's a real jerk. So they might fight him. Um, which is fine. Uh, maybe the devil is there to collect on Asmodeus's behalf. Well, yeah, so I don't think that, you know, I don't, the, the deal is, I think what I want to play with is that um, there are two different factions of Asmodeus agents now. And one of them is working with the Castellanters and one is sort of working, not exactly against necessarily, but they are, they're, they're kind of working to hedge the bet, right? And I think this guy uh, might be uh, hedging the bet. And what he wants, so, or he could be working for, you know, he wants to make sure that the castle anters pay up. Oh, so, yeah, and this could be a fun thing where, like, he doesn't care about the money. He cares about the souls, and he wants the souls of the three children. So he doesn't want the castle anters to get the money. Um, so I think his job is to go and he, like, you know, we know that you are, um, we know that you're involved in this whole thing, and we know that the castle enters are attempting to try to pay back the contract. We do not want that to happen. Um, so that so Asmodeus is playing both sides, the party and the castle enters. Yes, that is true. So and and all he wants to do is just make it clear, like you know, your job isn't just to get a hold of the money. Your job is to make sure. And he's telling Arana specifically, you and your friends. You know, your job is to make sure the Castle Lanterns don't get that money. You know, there are two conditions of the contract, and our boss wants only one of them to come forward, and that's that he wants the souls. And then the, the fun part is the party now, like, wait a minute, are we working for a devil? And is our job to make sure the Castle Lanterns aren't able to buy the souls back of their two children? Like, that sounds terrible. Like, we want to save the children, not the, we don't, you know. And so now there's like this fun. Um, you know, now there's this fun thing. He sounds like Ray Wise from Reaper. I don't know who that is. Um, I'll have to look that up. Um, he does need a name, this, this devil. Let's, let's go to grab a name here. Uh, Sly Flourish, start here, tools, names. Uh, his name is... Coster. Although I, I kind of like Little John. The accountant. <laughs> the link goose smasher yeah so these names are randomly generated so you get a lot of like knife bottom and tall stone um coster goldstone no gold strife coster gold strife that works because he's a gilded devil Uh, and the archetype. So sometimes we like to put, so now we have a, uh, 
uh, a new NPC. We will stick him up front. Coster Goldstrafe, Gilded Devil, uh, Lawful Evil, uh, Male Devil. Uh, and uh, his archetype will be Agent Smith. All right, so let's make it a female. Cost, yeah, Costra. Costra Goldstrife, and she's a female gilded devil, and she walks in and she talks like Agent Smith. Um, that that'll be a fun, strong start, I think. Uh, uh, and their job is to make sure that, yeah. So Coster tells, yeah, once the soul's not the money. They must fail on their contract. Uh, so we have Costra. Costra visits. Uh, uh, and then I think it's the infiltration of Growlhund Villa. Uh, so one of the fun bits of this adventure is that you do get this sort of heisty, heisty operation. Um, and uh, monsters we have. Um, ooh, so could the Gilded Devil give? Maybe the Gilded Devil... Uh, is it more fun to have like a devil like this guy come in and drop a magic item on you, or is it better to go win the magic item from your exploration of a place? Uh, I think it might be more fun to get it. So I think it'll we'll, we'll put it in uh, Growlhund Villa. One of my players is all about the magic items. Um, so they founded all this, blah, 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 blah. Uh... And then we have Growlhund Villa. Let's go to the player version and open a new tab. Nice, nice big map. Um, I should print that. I'm going to print that out. Print. Uh, pages. Out. How do I zoom it? Uh, I don't want it. I don't want it to be on two sheets of paper. I want one sheet of paper. More settings. So sort of fit to size. Sorry, I'm messing with. There we go. One sheet of paper. Print that. My printer sucks. So this way I can at least show some of Growlhund Villa. And the other one is there's a, I think there's a cellar, a basement, right? I'm going to, I'm going to have a basement. Uh, my printer sucks. Doesn't catch paper. So I have to screw with it all the time. Um, so I definitely want to have a basement where they, um, find an altar to Asmodeus. And they also find the portal that um, Erstal went through. So there's, it's one nice thing, I'll tell you, these Dyson maps, they, they print really nicely. You know, if you had a big format printer, I'd love to have a big format printer. You could almost do, you know, um, you could almost do printable, like full-size printable maps. Like an 11 by 17 printer would be awesome. I wonder if that, how well that prints in 11 by 17. Well, I don't have time. Better be cool. Love this coffee. Um, so uh, we should probably take a look 
and I'll probably do a little bit of homework um, beforehand. So Grauhan Villa is, the Stone of Galore came here. The whole deal is that Erstel Floxen came here um, and to confront, yeah. So I guess I did get this from the adventure. Sometimes I think like it's my idea and it's like, oh no, that wasn't the adventure. And the idea that Erstel Floxen was fireballed by Yaha Grauhan's nimble right and meddled in the mission. Um, so there's this whole thing about him locking her up. That's not going to happen. He's going to he's gonna make his way through. She's going to use a teleporter to kind of send him on his way. Uh, and that will start the chase, the chase sequence in chapter three. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so we have uh, all this, but what's the deal going on in here? Um, they can sneak around in the villa. Um, there's, yeah, cult fanatics and mastiffs and, you know, all kinds of things here. Um, libraries, locked tomes, lots of opportunity to drop in. And I don't, I don't remember what happened in here. I guess that's a great piece of art. So that's Erstel Flox. And I guess he's burned because of the fireball, right? You got fireball and he's mad. He murders somebody, doesn't he? Um, And the city watch shows up again. And that takes him to fourth. Uh, in, argument going on between Grauhans and the Erstel crew. Yeah, and that could that would make sense, right? That that they're, you know, uh, Erstel, Erstel's probably kind of mad. So I think like his, he probably has his own little group of thugs or group of guys that are working for him. Um, and they get involved. We've already seen that because they, they ran into some of those in Troll Skull. So there could be this ongoing fight between the Floxens and the the ex Zinterim guys that now work for I'm sorry the the Growlhens and the Floxen group right um, that would make sense uh, and they're all funded by the Castle Hunters. Um, so I think, you know, this, this today's, today's, uh, today's episode, today's, uh, game is going to be primarily involved in that. Um, it's going to be pretty straightforward. One, I think this, this adventure definitely has this sort of like sweeping hill where, you know, everything is kind of real slow and then all of a sudden everything moves real fast. And I think things are going to move fast here and I think it's perfectly fine to move fast. So this chapter can be a quick one. Um, and my group will certainly not mind. Uh, they're supposed to get to third, fourth level in this one, and I think they will. Um, uh, I could, you know, in my case, I would get them to fifth. I might delay the leveling on this one. They might not level after this chapter, and instead will level after the next. And I think I'll level them right before they sort of go into the main, the main thing. You kind of got to feel out the best times to level up the characters given given what's going on. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we are. Um, I feel pretty good about it. I'll probably do a little bit more reading of, of the rooms that are in, uh, and of course always print out a map and then leave it sitting aside and then forget it when you go into your game. That's, that's a key. There's a slight flourish tip for you. It's at least one I do almost every time I get so busy. Um, so what else is going on in the world of D and D next by the time we have our next show, we will know about uh, what is happening uh, at the descent. D and D, the descent. Play the new storyline. Um, the descent is going to be a live show uh, on Twitch, beginning 2 p.m. Pacific time on my birthday, May 17th. So that's 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Oh, and there's wallpaper. Wallpapers. Uh, 
Showing folder. Why is that not showing in my folder? So that's the wallpaper for it. Uh, whoops, let's close that there. There we go. And um, so it's pretty sure, I'm pretty confident. I'm a little less confident now, but I was more confident that it was like a planescape -y thing. But now it's like, well, it's, it's, it's probably a blood war thing because they've been doing a lot of blood war talk. So I shouldn't slouch. I end up going way off camera. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what actually it is about. Okay, get the art so There's no, no great way to get the art. Um, it'll be interesting to see what it is. I'm excited for it. I know that they said that Beetle and Grimm is going to be doing a platinum box for it. So it sounds like it's an adventure, like maybe another big year campaign adventure. That might be kind of cool. Um, we're going to be swimming in a lot of adventures. Oh, I just shot a rubber band across the room. Um, we're going to be swimming in a lot of adventures, if, assuming that this is an adventure. But it could be something completely different. You know, maybe they're trying a new product type. It'd be kind of it'd be kind of interesting to see if they're trying out a new a new product type. Um, I just can't get this thing to fit what window. I guess because widescreen. Uh, he's not your problem. Says, how do you plan on approach the next chapter of encounters? I'm concerned with my group that there are too many encounters and that it's just the party chasing after the stone without getting. It. Yes, that is a huge problem in that chase scene. Uh, chapter, we're talking about chapter four, which is the chase. And uh, what I highly recommend, and I ran this when I ran the play test of it, um, is A, you shrink the number of steps, and B, it's not a chase, that's an investigation. So the stone is already gone, and it's the party's job is to hunt down Floxen and how he passed the stone from one place to the other to try to see if they can intercept it before it shows up at the castle Lanterns. So their goal is to find out where it's going. And they can do so by following the steps without a chase. So they go to each of those places and they deal with like a, a scene, but they don't have to, you know, run through it. Because, yeah, it's a problem that there's like eight different steps and they never get the stone. And there's all kinds of like, even if they get the stone, the stone's a dick. So, yeah, it's not that's, it's not a great way. It's not It's not a great motivation as is. But a way to fix it and still use everything that's there is think of it as, as steps in a trail of clues instead of a chase. Uh, that is what I have done before, and that worked really well, and that's what I'm planning on doing again, is he's already gone, right? By the time they're dealing with it, he's gone, and now they've got to, you know, follow where he where he went. Um, that worked pretty well. Um, not the main character says, I'm hoping it's centered on the Blood War. It seems to be. Uh, I think they said that that image is Zariel. Uh, the the angel that's kind of falling down upon the devil hands is Zariel. And if you know anything about Zariel, you know that she is now the leader of the first level of hell. Um, uh, you know, she's she's the on the first level of hell. And um, so she, she succumbs to them. So it'll be kind of interesting. You know, I don't know what the thing's about. We'll have to find out. But we'll be finding out in less than a week. You know, we'll know. We'll know on Friday. And they said there's four different products. So... I wouldn't be surprised if we hear about two different books and maybe then other other things, but we'll see. Um, I have no idea. Uh, and, you know, there's not enough of a pattern and trend. One thing, I think Merle said it before, he's like, don't try to draw a pattern to what they we've done in the past because we do different things every time. And I think that's been true. They've put out two big campaign adventures very close to each other with Waterdeep Dragon Heist and Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. They put out things that are done by third parties that they publish, like the Acquisitions Incorporated book and the... Um, uh, Ghost of Salt Marsh, which was done by Cobalt Press. Um, so, and then this one looks like it was done internally. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that works. I think it'd be cool if it was kind of set back in time when she fell. Yeah, it could be. Maybe it's, maybe it goes back in time. Who knows? You know, it's hard, hard to predict any details of it, but I have a feeling it's somewhere in the plains and something to do with uh, the Blood War. Um, you know, is it a low level adventure or high level adventure? Is it an adventure at all? Or is it a campaign setting? Who knows? Um... Um, Sondheim God says, can you recommend any vids for a new vid for a, a, for new DM on creating homebrew encounters? So depends on what you mean by uh, uh, the answer is probably not. I don't really, I, I'm sure Matt Colville has something. Matt Colville talks about everything. So 
You could probably go through Matt Colville's videos and look for ones where he talks about encounter building. Uh, it depends on what you mean by an, uh, a homebrew encounter. Are you talking about like a scene and building a scene? Like how do you build a scene? Are you talking about combat encounters? Uh, sometimes encounter and combat encounter get mashed together. I have a tendency of doing that. Um, I will offer up uh, that I have a bunch of articles, not really videos, for uh, encounter building and one of, or for new DMs. And one of them is um, a new DMs guide for building combat encounters, which I'll stick in the chat. So I had, you know, everything I know about encounter building, I stuck in that article. Uh, I was commissioned by um, the folks at D&D Beyond to write this. I spent a lot of time pondering this topic and um, there's a lot there, uh, including like a really simple cheat sheet for um, how to make, how to, how to scale encounters. Um, I also uh, did a deep dive. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, an article on the deep dive with um, Teos. I thought it was on here. I know I did one with him. I did two with him. Uh, so Jeremy Crawford, the, 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 you know, this, this is a real good one. Jeremy Crawford and Encounter Building. Um, this is supposed to be a, yeah, I did an episode. I can't believe I don't have a write-up of my Jeremy Crawford episode, but I do. Um, if you go to the DMs Deep Dive, um, I have numerous episodes. And one of them was on, yeah, so here's the episode. Uh, uh, Jeremy, would you please introduce? I have to stop that. Um, that is an episode of where of monster design where I talked to Jeremy Crawford about it. And then there was another one where Teos Abadia and I, uh, I think I'll close that. Um, with Wolfgang, Dungeon Monster. Yeah, here is one I did. Good enough. Uh, here is one I did with uh, Teos talking about encounter building. So those are two. Yeah, if you want a video, that's that's one. Um, Teos and I talked about encounter building for a while. Um, uh, so take a look at those. Hopefully that helps. Uh, he's not your problem. Said I've taken to heart the Mike Merle's advice for your episode of him of speeding up leveling. Yeah, it's interesting. I, so I'm running Shadow of the Demon Lord now, and um, we level every session, and uh, the power gain of the characters increases very quickly, and it means we're having an 11 session game, 11 session campaign, and that's it. 11 three hour sessions, 33 hours, and then we're done. And um, I think that the leveling. I think if you're going to level that quickly, like level every session, I, you know, I think you can do it. I, you know, a lot of people are like, oh my God, how do you do that in D&D? But you can, you, you can definitely do it. And um, the way though is, is make sure that the campaign supports it. Like you want to know that the, the arc of your campaign should be as steep as the power of the characters. So it's hard to do with a published adventure because like, you know, if you were to do that with like Tomb of Annihilation, they'd be like level 20 when they get to the tomb and then they're like wishing their way through it. So you really have to kind of tune your tune your adventure. Uh, I'm running Princes of the Apocalypse. I have, you, if you watch this channel, you'll see that I've done some Prince of the Apocalypse, um, Princes of the Apocalypse video, prep videos. And um, we play so infrequently that I've been increasing, I've been leveling them every session in that one. And then I've been cutting out huge swaths of the campaign so that they're going to bigger and bigger stuff so that, you know, it's a shorter campaign where they're leveling faster. Um, so I, I think you have to build your campaign to scale up with its story, the same level, the same, at the same pace that the characters are gaining levels, but it can be done. I think you just got to plan both at the same time. I don't think you could say like, oh, I'm going to do that with with um, Ghost of Saltmarsh. Uh, you know, because maybe not. But like, you know, now Adventures League does it for level one to five, you know? So if you're already leveling one to five, one every session, and if you want to speed it up, then just keep going that way, you know? So... Uh, so we have hit 11 o'clock. I need to get all my crap together. I need to remember to bring my map with me when I go today. That's very important. 
not that important. It's all right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming to the show today. I especially want to thank those of you who have supported me on Patreon. Thank you very much. Uh, your, 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 your money is going to good causes to keep this Life Flourish Empire alive. And um, uh, I want to thank everybody who was live on Twitch. I hope you had a good time. Uh, happy Mother's Day. Oh, is it Mother's Day? It's Mother's Day. Oh, it is Mother's Day. Oh my God, I got to call my mom. Don't tell my mom. I got to call her. Um, but she did get, uh, she, there's something on the way for her though. I hope, I hope she got it. Mom, did you get the thing that you're supposed to get for Mother's Day? I don't know. We'll find out. Call your mom. Uh, and I will see all of you guys next week. And we will be talking about, man, all the things. So uh, we'll be talking about the things that came up in the descent. And maybe we'll know more about Salt Marsh by then. Salt Marsh won't be out by then, but we'll see. Uh, so, um, mom, you should be getting a thing. Expect to get a thing. But I don't know if it'll be today. We'll see. Uh, all right. I will talk to you guys later. And uh, have a great week. And go play some D&D.